So this talk came out, well, it, it, I'm here because of a tweet. I tweeted, who wants to know, you know if, if, would anyone be interested in a talk about running end-to-end uh, -end tests in milliseconds? And, 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 uh, and, and Matt responded, yes, do it at QCup, so here I am. Um, so I'm, it's really a case study of uh, a project we're on, how we approached functional and end-to-end -end, uh, system testing. It's going to be warts and all. Um, but it is about, if I can use a, uh, a phrase, it's about the logistics of testing. So I guess, quick show of hands, who here would call themselves a tester? OK, well, software developer? Uh, yeah. Some of those are the same people. So that's probably the ideal talk for you. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so it's about our testing strategy. But let's, let's start with uh, how we got to the, what I'm going to talk about, um, which was, uh, let's see. Computers, eh? Um, there we go. Let's try that. Brilliant. OK, so a familiar story, right? Uh, this is a new project that we were on. It was uh, the first pro sort of project that was starting a large program of work for the organization I work for, which is a publisher. Um, annoyingly, this story happened, even though I've seen it before. Um, so the, the, the organization, when we started the project, had quite a siloed culture. Um, you know, front-end devs and back-end devs were different. QAs were responsible for testing uh, and so on. And, and so when we joined, you know, this was one of the sort of cultural uh, impediments that we were trying to overcome as well as deliver a new uh, uh, important, like, first product of, an in, of a product suite for the company. Um, so we were trying to get in uh, sort of BDD stuff. We were inspired by the screenplay pattern that Antonio Marcano uh, has written about. Does anyone recognize that when I say screenplay pattern? OK, a few, few people put their hands up. The screenplay pattern is nice because it, it models the users of your software in the test uh, as actors who can, who can sort of perform tasks and ask questions and examine the outputs of your software. And, and that sort of like helps you think about, uh, about about your users while writing the test. It's a really nice way of also decomposing all the complexity, all the, all the technological jibber-jabber that goes into a functional test suite uh, into sort of a nice object model of actors and tasks and things like that. So we were sort of talking about this in the team. Um, uh, but the QAs in this sort of siloed model that we initially had, they, they were basically responsible for writing functional tests for, for testing, but also automating those tests. And, and so they, they went out and they found a, a framework, a BDD framework. They did lots of things, did lots of things, uh, but it also did the screenplay pattern, which is why they picked it. Um, uh, and started writing tests, um, but this framework was very sort of heavy on the magic. It was full of uh, reflection and mutable state and thread local variables and global variables. And, 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 and we had a, a development team who wanted to write pure functional code, have type safety, null safety, immutable data. Um, and so there was a real disconnect between these two sides of the project. We had uh, like the functional test being written in one sort of culture of, of coding, and the main code being written in another culture of coding, and they didn't interact very much. Uh, and, and so, you know, when, when uh, this, this caused a problem because we, we start getting less feedback between the tests uh, and the development code because every time the developers started looking at this test code, they would sort of throw their hands up in horror and sort of step away from it. Um, because it was very reflection heavy, they couldn't use their IDEs to quickly learn about the code that was being written uh, by QAs. Um, and so, so we became more and more siloed. Uh, and with all the problems that, that you'd expect when that happens, the, 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 the QAs writing functional tests were, were modeling the, the user, modeling the application, right? Building domain models that were exactly the same that the developers were building inside the applications, but were just had been written all over again uh, in Java, uh, rather than in you know, Kotlin. Um, uh, uh, then uh, it got worse. The, the sort of the QAs themselves became siloed. Some focused on sort of manual and exploratory testing, and it ended up being just one person focusing on the development of the functional tests. Um, and because there was no feedback back into the development of the system and the design of the system, they became less and less reliable because we weren't making the system easy to test based on the feedback from the experience trying to write system tests. 
And so then they start becoming brittle because we weren't building in the appropriate hooks to allow it to synchronize with the system. When the user interface changed, these tests would all break. Uh, and it just became incredibly expensive. They were read all the time. No one really cared uh, because they knew that the tests were buggy rather than the system because all the exploratory testing was finding this thing was like working really well. The, the development team were doing TDD on their bits. It was just the end-to-end -end functional tests that were read. And eventually, they got, just got turned off. Right? It's not a great situation to be in. Well, we didn't turn them off. We took them off the build monitor. Right? Um, so, like, disaster. So we knew at this point, like, you know, this has really got into a bad state. We've got to do something about this. And so we basically all got together and we like, right, we're going to have a new approach to the way we do functional testing. So this is what we basically all agreed on, uh, which was, right, any automation is a software development job. Developers do it with input from QAs. Um, but QAs are responsible for exploratory, manual, and qualitative testing. So automated testing is great. It gives you numbers. 20 out of 20 tests are passing, or 95% passing, or whatever it is. But it doesn't tell you anything about, like, what's it like to use this as a user? Right? So QAs became responsible for deeply understanding the constraints, the pressures that the users were in, and feeding that back to the development team as they were using the software, tr like, and trying different routes based on their understanding. So they started becoming much more closely aligned with the UX team as well as the development team, they, uh, and with project managers and the product designers, um, and, 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 and were, were bringing really great input. Uh, when the developers were able to work on the automation and feed that back into the design of the system to make the automation become cheaper and cheaper. And then the other uh, rule that we came up with was, right, we don't want any duplication of, of modeling between the production system and the tests. If I want to model an author who wants to publish something, the model of what an author is represented as is going to be the same. So we actually want to write our end-to-end -end functional tests purely in terms of the domain model. We don't want to talk about the user interface or the technical infrastructure or the deployment architecture. We just want to be able to talk about the domain model and the tests and have that drive the system end to end if we want to. How do we go about doing that was then the challenge. So, so we'd picked uh, what people call the hexagonal architecture or the ports and adapters architecture. Our system was actually made up of a lot of services, so we had lots of little hexagons being deployed inside services. Um, and, and we had an insight, which is, well, all the domain logic lives in the middle of this hexagon. That's what we want to test. The adapter layer and all the technical jibber-jabber on the outside of that hexagon is not performing any business logic at all. All it's doing is a linear mapping. Uh, here's some pseudo maths to make it look intellectual. Uh, so, like, so uh, like a mapping from some technical events over here into the business logic, or some like business logic stuff here into like SQL queries and updates. So, this can be generated, uh, right? So we are generating this mapping here, but what we want to do is, given a things from the domain model we want to create actions here. So that's just inverse the mapping, right? So what we want to be able to do is, given mappings here, have inverse mappings here for any point in the system that we want to interact with, but model, it, model that interaction only with the domain model. So here's like what, what it would look like if we had our thing running in an HTTP service. So our test driver might be interacting at the service interface and it would just invert the, like, a, mo a mapping from actions on the domain model into HTTP posts and gets and things like that. And then the job of the actual service interface itself would be to map HTTP posts and gets and things into actions on the domain model. And this applies at wider and wider scales of the system. No matter how wide you go, these mappings into the domain logic don't add any more business logic themselves. So once we've deployed it into our cloud, well, there's a whole load of other bits and bobs in here doing replication, load balancing, security, and what have you, but it's still the same mapping. Uh, there's no extra business logic that we might want to test. 
and wider. We might now, when we're actually deploying it as a web application, we'll have a front end cluster that is generating HTML and JavaScript assets that are then running a web browser. And they're just doing a linear mapping of user interaction events via a web browser uh, all the way through into like, the HTTP service interactions at the service cluster. But they're still not doing any domain logic. They're just adding usability. Right? And so if we want to test via the browser through the user interface, we want to basically take another inverse mapping right, and apply that. And we can take the same way of thinking about our test, exactly the same test code was the goal, right, that just talks in terms of domain model objects, inverse mappings like in the test, and then map them back again into the domain model in the system, and we should be able to test that logic. And then when we deploy it into production, we put in features that will allow us to test the system when it's deployed into production. And there's a whole load of stuff that, that happens out here in the, you know, in the global CDN, uh, caching rules that are being updated by who knows who and when, which can interfere with your system. So it's great to be able to actually run a system test to check that does the whole system still hang together even when the infrastructure, which is totally out of our control, is being monkeyed around with without us ever knowing about it. And again, it's the same mapping, same mappings in and out of the domain model, uh, whether you're going globally through a CDN with like, you know, geographically load balance across different uh, data centers and all the way into the tiny little domain model objects that are running in those data centers, uh, or whether you're actually just doing it right there uh, in your IDE. So all of this technical stuff, it adds non-cross-functional requirement support, right? It implements security, scalability, availability, uh, usability, um, but it's not adding any more business logic. But it can really interfere with your business logic. If caching rules change here and you've not done your caching properly, then it could actually affect the way that you know, users see pages and interfere with their ability to make use of that business logic, but none of it is adding any more. So given that, we want to be able to write a test that just uses our domain model here, um, but we'll be able to apply these mappings. And so we, we basically took the, the screenplay pattern, and we just took the metaphor of a screenplay uh, of actors, and we just sort of turned it up to 11. We're like, well, what else do we see in screenplays? Right, so we actually have a production of a film, let's say. Uh, and, and the production of a film is basically decides how am I interfacing with the system. A production uh, basically creates scenarios. So each test is a scenario. There are some roles in this scenario. There's some authors, there's some editors. An author might want to submit a manuscript. An editor reviews it and decides whether it needs amendment or not. Um, but, but the roles, which are the tests care about, are implemented by different actors in our system. So we separated out these two concepts. An actor is responsible for interfacing with the system through some system interface and uh, implementing the tasks that a role can perform um, by acting upon the system interface, which will then cause an action to occur on the domain model. Very abstract, I know. Uh, I will show a picture of some actual code. OK, so can anyone read that? It's a bit of a blurry screen, I'm afraid. And I'll, I'll put these up online, and you can all have a look. But um, I'll point at it with a little laser, and maybe that will help. Uh, so we create a scenario. Here's a test. An editor can request an amendment. We create a scenario by talking to the production and asking for a scenario. And the scenario defines the roles that are going to be playing, being played by actors in the scenario. I want a new author called Alice. I want a new editorial staff member called Ed. And, and behind the scenes, these will be played by an actor that is actually introduced by the production. Uh, then Alice has submitted some, some manuscript. Uh, then Ed can request an amendment of that manuscript. Alice can review and change her manuscript. And then Ed can see the new amendment appearing in the peer review system for further review. Okay, very, very simple test. Um, but, but that can drive a lot of system-wide logic, or it can run directly against the domain model. So uh, in this case, like the submission details here, that's an actual domain model object that's used in production. 
in the production code, um, as is you know, all of these constants and everything else. These are all just straight out of the domain model. So if we wanted to, this would be like you know, in the quick tests, these are running against just objects. They're just testing the behavior of the objects. Um, but they can also map through the sort of the back background uh, or the actors in the background. Uh, they can map uh, into HTTP requests or driving a browser or whatever we want to do uh, against our cloud, against uh, the system running on our local developer workstation or what have you, uh, depending on how much of the system we want to test. So this allows us to, to write a system test, but also when we're working in the domain logic, run the system test very, very fast to get quick feedback. So what, what the benefits we got here were, well, it was we were able to run our test very quickly against the, against the domain model entirely in memory, but we were also able to take exactly the same test code and run it against a deployed system in various configurations and at various points in the system against a service API, against a browser. The tests were quick to write, and they got quicker and quicker to write because we were writing the tests uh, and driving the, the design of the domain model uh, and the, the design of the system. The feedback from the tests meant that we were able to build more uh, testability into the system as a whole, uh, which meant that like, they became faster and faster to write and more and more reliable. Um, the, uh, the, the API is type safe, so we get lots of IDE support, refactoring support. Uh, writing a new test drives out the domain model for you so that when you come to implement it, the domain model is already what you want it to be. The tests were easy to read, given that it's code. Admittedly, it's not natural language. Um, but behind the scenes, we have some reporting as well that reports some, uh, some business rules in natural language when we want to show them to business analysts. Um, but the, the tests are very concise. They do a lot of logic, but they can do it in a small amount of code because we're able to refactor higher and higher abstractions. And they don't have any user interface details in them and no technical details. You don't know in a test whether you're running against a, a JSON API or against a web browser. It's the same test. You're just looking at the logic of, of what can happen in the system. And there was no duplication in the test code between the production code and the test code, which was you know, very useful. So that we could change the, the, them both much more rapidly together. But warts and all, it was, uh, it was a challenge. It was more complicated than people were used to. It was a different way of testing than people were used to, where people initially uh, had an, a, a bit of a, there was a bit of a sort of a hump where uh, we didn't really know what to do with this capability of being able to run tests in different scales. Maybe it was, you know, there's a lot of debate. Is it too complicated? Do we just not care? Uh, so one of the things was the un what is the process of TDD now that we can write tests like this? Do we start from the outside? Like, just start by uh, thinking about the, 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 the HTML, the, the HTTP interfaces, um, and start writing mappings uh, all the way down until we get to the point where we start writing the business logic? Or do we start with the business logic? Because we can run that really, really fast and then decide to map it out uh, uh, write all the mapping so we can deploy it into a, into a live environment. Um, and this was like, well, what do we do? We, we have a, you know, the, uh, the, the Growing Object Technology Software book has a very nice strict methodology in it, and this kind of like threw that up in the air. Uh, we do both. Uh, there isn't a right answer. Uh, sometimes uh, we're working purely in the domain model, and all the mappings are already there. So we write the, the domain model. Uh, we run the tests, and they run in the system scale as well because, because the mappings have been written. Sometimes we're writing new interfaces to, uh, to services or new HTML interfaces, and at that point, we, have to, we, we work the other way. We think, right, what's the interface going to be? Let's write the mappings to and from the domain model and drive out the domain model as we go from that way. And you know, different stories have, have different processes, uh, whatever fits best. The other problem we encountered pretty soon was a combinational, combina, com, com, there was a lot of mappings to write. <laughs> uh, so you can imagine like there's a whole bunch of actions that, that an actor can perform on the interfaces of the system or on the domain model. And there's a lot of different interfaces into the system. 
Right? Here's like there's a you know you can directly talk to the domain model. You can hit a service API. You can hit a browser uh, with the JavaScript turned on. Then you've got to also worry well about the JavaScript turned off. And then right, suppose we want to add a, add an Android app. Right? Uh, suddenly we've got to write all those mappings for a new interface. Um, and what happens every this is, this changes more often. What happens every time we add uh, a new action that the user is performing in the system, we've got to write mappings for all of these, uh, all of these system interfaces. Right? And that's just explodes. The amount of work just is, is crazy. So we solved it by coming up with a lingua franca, a sort of a common representation of all of the interactions that a user can have with the system. Apart from the domain model, which is, well, you don't need to map to that. You just call it directly. We we defined a, a model of user interaction, and then inside any actors that interfaced with a, uh, with a system interface that was remote in some kind of way, uh, the actor would uh, use common mappings from the domain model actions into a model of user interaction, and then the actor's responsibility was to map user interactions onto a service interface. And so that then meant that instead of having you know, m times n uh, mappings to write, you had like, M plus N. And these would be often, you know, these would be ready. So you'd write these, you'd, you'd just say, oh, well, you know, to enter, to submit a manuscript, you have to enter the title. That's entering text, the title, enter an abstract, enter text. So you'd just be using things that already existed that already had mappings. So this made it faster and faster to basically add new actions into systems. And then as you go further and further out through the system, you know, especially when you hit a user interface, you find that actually there's multiple ways of mapping from a user interaction or for, or for a domain action into an interaction at a service interface. If you think about a user interface, there's multiple ways that you might navigate through a user interface to get to the screens that you need to use to input data. You might see the data being presented in different places in the screen. What do we do about that? So there's sort of two options you could we could right, uh, choose. Uh, and the one we choose was just, uh, we chose the, the bottom one. But like one of them would just pick a random one, right? Uh, every test run, pick a random navigation and a random thing to look at on the screen. Um, and over a lot of runs, just run it all the time, over a lot of runs, you'll have tested a huge amount of your, your code. Right? You, you'll get, a, you know, a run through doesn't tell you that it's absolutely correct. But just checking exactly the same thing all the time usually doesn't tell you it's correct. Um, so this is like a sort of property testing, just continually shaking down the application with random inputs, which should all behave the same way, uh, can sort of chase out sort of uh, accidental bugs that you have slipped through. Um, uh, but the, because of the sort of limitations of our uh, continuous integration pipeline system, we didn't pick that one. We actually uh, put in a lot of unit tests to make sure that any, any different ways of doing the same thing all behave the same way. And then in our functional test, we just pick one. Computers. Did that work? Ah. So, so uh, you know, it's been uh, interesting and useful. Um, let's look back a bit more. So one of, the, one of the sort of issues we had with it uh, was, was, was uh, complexity, particularly here where we have a, one way of mapping through user actions into service interfaces, and then the domain model, the direct domain model one is, is different. Right? And there's a lot of discussion in the team, like, is it worth keeping the in-memory mappings? Why don't we just have system tests and not have functional tests that run against the domain model? Because they're different, there's a little bit of, sort of mental overhead in dealing with all of this extra complexity. But every time we dug into like, a, a case where it looked like hitting the domain model directly was, a, was, a, was actually inappropriate, we would find that either our application wasn't conforming to its architectural conventions, so there was business logic being done in an adapter layer, for example, um, or our domain model was just wrong, right? Uh, and so it, it turned out that every time we were having this debate, fixing the design of our system uh, made the problem go away. So we were actually happy to keep it. Um, 
But this, you know, it is system testing, uh, and I guess like system testing, the testing pyramid is on everyone's mind. Um, you know, why are we bothering with system testing? Uh, haven't you heard about the testing pyramid? Shouldn't you be doing everything with unit tests and everything? Yes, we do have a lot of unit tests, and we definitely have more unit tests than system tests. Um, but in our, in our application, we deploy into the cloud. Uh, we have uh, you know, a, a public cloud and a CDN. There's lots and lots of technical, technical jibber-jabber between the business logic that we want to let the users access and uh, their ability to access it. And, and so, but none of that technical stuff is easily isolatable. Some of it's owned by other companies. Some of it is inside networking equipment. Um, and so we do want to be able to test uh, that. Like, none of it is interfering with the ability of users to use the application. And by, by running that through in production, we get like, a way of production monitoring uh, and detecting this stuff, uh, even in our live environment, which you know, takes design of the system uh, in order to let you do that safely in production. So we created sort of you know, fake, fake users, fake journals, fake you know, uh, uh, sort of configurations where they're not going to affect real users, but they can be used by automated tests. But I think the real reason, that, like, a, a really valuable reason to do this uh, and, and to think about system testing is because we don't just want a system test, we want to test drive the designer at the system scale. So, so this is, uh, this is a, a diagram from the Goose book, um, and, and this encapsulates what I think is what test driven development, one of its key feedback loops, which is you know, when we come to write a test and try and make it fail, if it's hard to write that test, you go back and you refactor the system until it's easy to write the test. Um, if it's hard to diagnose, uh, what's gone wrong when the test has failed, you go back and you change the design of the system until your test can produce a good diagnostic output. Okay. At the system scale, that means adjusting the architecture to support system-wide testing. So at, to test a, a, a system as a whole, there's five things that, we, that our system test suite, our automated system test suite has to be able to do has to know what the system is doing. Is it actually doing what I think it's doing? Uh, otherwise, it's, it's failing this test. It has to know when it's stopped doing it, so it can run the next test. It has to know when it's failed right, and, uh, and be able to report that failure nicely uh, by explaining what has gone wrong with the system. And then it's got to be able to somehow get the system back into a good state so that we can then start running the next test. And what we found is that this applies to supporting the system as well. Right? If I am supporting a system with live users, I need to be able to know that it's what it's doing and that, it, and that people are using it successfully. I need to know uh, when you know, it's having downtime, that I can do an upgrade or whatever. Um, I need to know uh, if the system has failed and me as an, as an administrator has to get in and do something uh, to fix it. I have to be able to understand what's gone wrong with it so I can fix it. And I have to be able to get the system back into a good state. So what we found is that as by test driving at the system scale, we've made our system more and more supportable, right? uh, where like test driving at the unit scale makes the code more and more maintainable. At the system scale, we get more and more management support in the system, appropriate interfaces that can be used with management tools, management user interfaces, and things like that. That's the end. Uh, how am I doing for time? Is there any yeah. Thank you. How are you doing for time is uh, that we've got time for a few questions while we switch the Excellent. video over. Okay. So, what questions do we have for Nat in the room? Have I got these the right way around? Is the, not green, the green one's mine, this one's Tom's. Is it right. on? Yes. That's good. <laughs> you may now ask your question. Thank you, Matt. Um, that was a, a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so do you run all of your functional tests like four times? Do you run the whole suite like at each scale, or do you have some kind of, like what, what happens there on every test run? So, so yeah, from, on every commit, so we, we have a number of scales that we can run at. Uh, we, 
like on the developer workstation, we run it in memory. Uh, and we can also run it with all the services spun up in the same process. So a whole bunch of HTTP services talking to each other, but in the same process. So that allows us to reproduce things we see when running against the cloud, right? but debuggable. So that's a really handy thing. Uh, but we don't run that in the CI CD pipelines. In the, in the CD pipelines, we deploy the whole thing into an internal cloud, and then we run the system tests against that. So, yeah. And then we have some that like, just occasionally hit the live system to check things are happy. I've got a question. What do you do about asynchrony, Nat? So where, where do you allow asynchrony within the sort of layers of what you test? Good, yeah. So, so one of the differences between our interpretation of the screenplay pattern and the one that Anthony has published is that we don't allow actors to ask questions. So if you ask the system a question and then assert on its answer, you don't know when the system, in an asynchronous system, you don't know when the system has finished computing that answer, right? Um, and so uh, we only allow the, the actors to do things and they might fail, right? Uh, or to, to do something that they're not allowed to do and assert that they weren't allowed to do it. Uh, and so that allows particular actor implementations to implement asynchrony uh, as appropriate for the system interface. So and then, Go for on. the in-memory model, we run all the hexagons with a sort of in-memory simulation of what that asynchronous behavior between the components would be. So, but how do you assert anything then if the actors can't ask questions? How, how do you check so, so the state, it'd be the something end state? Like, right, uh, I'm going to say I can check, like the, actor, the, the author can uh, amend the title of their paper, right? Uh, and in memory, you just go set the title, and you've got a unit test that says, well, if I set the title on a thing, it works. Um, but in the HTTP implementation, you would do an HTTP request, and then you would like check that it did the right thing. Right? And in the browser, you would navigate to the appropriate field, enter the data, and check, and then submit and check that when I went back and looked at it, it was already there. So right. as wider and wider scales, you have to deal with the asynchrony, you have to but it's the act of being able to perform something that matters, and, and you write your test so that the, what you're saying you want to perform also make, allows you to ask the appropriate questions. Okay. So there wouldn't be thens in the same context as a cucumber where you'd say then the user gets an email or something? You we have things like, yeah, I mean, you'd say then the user can, you know, re read the response from the editor, and that would be waiting for it to turn up okay. on an email and then like check that the text was appropriate. Yeah. Right. What other questions do we have for Nat? There's one. Um, you mentioned that you uh, were using this in live system as well with uh, fake accounts. Um, if you're coupled with third parties that do expensive things, how do you yeah, keep we, those bills under control? We're lucky in that respect. Yeah, um, we don't. We have reference data from third parties, but we don't. Ha we don't interact with them. So it's, it's internal. Yeah. Uh, oh well. Apart from we've, we've got an internal downstream system. So our fake, our fake journal would have, rather than going to the real publishing system, which would. We, which we wouldn't want for tests, it goes into a fake publishing system. So, so at the very, very edges where we can, because it's internal, uh, we can like root. So we've actually, you know, it's changing the design of the system. This is a requirement that's not needed. We don't have more than one publishing system, but for testing purposes, we've added in support for that. How did you get permission to do all of this work to just make great testing infrastructure from the people who presumably didn't really care about having testing infrastructure so much as having great features on the application that you're testing. I never asked. 